Hello, it's John Heaton, and today I'm going to review this album from George Harrison, released in late 1987. Uh, and before I show you the album, which was the first George album for five years, uh, I'm going to show you a couple of singles, one of which preceded the album. This got my mind set on you. Uh, I think it came out two or three weeks before the album and surprised everyone by reaching number one in the US and number two in the UK and George hadn't had a top ten hit for a long time so uh, forget the last one he had probably something like uh, Give Me Love was his number one last number one in, in the US uh, I think all those years ago it did reach the top number two in the US but not a very big hit in the UK so certainly in the UK it was his biggest hit for a long time and probably in the US his biggest hit uh, I think his biggest hit since Give Me Love because he hadn't had a number one although we'll see years ago did to get number two so tremendous excitement when this single and when this album came out because George hadn't been active for five years since Gone Troppo so Looking at it, I suppose it's comparable to the five-year wait we had for John Lennon to make an album between 75 and 80. Uh, although I think I was more excited with John's comeback, probably because I was 16, whereas when this happened I was 23, so just maybe one gets a little bit less excited as one gets older, but it was still a big deal. And uh, So I went out and bought the single. I remember getting home and putting it on the turntable and hearing this intro on the drums and thinking, this doesn't sound like a George song. And uh, whilst I was happy to see it do well in the charts, it's never really been a favourite of mine. He didn't write it, a guy called Rudy Clark wrote it. Um, we were happy for George to have success, but... Uh, and it's quite a catchy song, There's nothing wrong with it, it's just not... A sublime song like Give Me Love, for example, or Blow Away, in my opinion. It did come with a nice poster, um, which has still got the blue tack, blue tack marks. It's in pretty good shape. So George very heavily promoted this album with a long series of interviews on TV and radio. I remember him being on Radio 1 and programs like The Tube on TV, and uh, he made no less than three promo videos for this album, two for the song Got My Mind Set On You, and then one for When We Was Fab, which is this next single, and then one for the song This Is Love. Uh, when We Was Fab is one of the most successful tracks on the album, this is the 12-inch with Klaus Warman doing the updated drawing of George, like he'd done for Revolver. Uh, what is it, 21 years earlier. It's a nice cover. And uh, this doesn't come with a poster, but it's on the nice Dark Horse label. And uh, just to mention the B-sides, so this one has a B-side called Zigzag. And this is signed by Ray Cooper. You probably can't pick that out. But to John, this which is Ray Cooper, so I must have met him outside some concert or other, probably in Eric Clapton, I can't remember. I used to carry album sleeves around with me. And then, perhaps more interesting, is the B-side to this included the track Lay His Head, which was one of the rejects from somewhere in England, and that was the first time it had been released on vinyl. And uh, when I had the good fortune to meet George Harrison outside the artist's entrance to Wembley Arena in October, 1987, uh, he was arriving with Jeff Lynn for a Bob Dylan concert. I, I congratulated him on the single rather hypocritically because I didn't particularly like it. But then I, I said, I'm, yeah, I'm glad, I genuinely said, I'm glad you released Lay's Head on the B side. It's an excellent track. And he turned to look at me and said, Yeah, yeah, that's to save using up some of the new ones. So that was my 10 five second conversation with uh, George Harrison. And then this little box came out when we was fab. I'll show you the album in a minute, of course, which had some goodies in it, like Sergeant Pepper cutout. 
and uh, the actual single itself would zigzag. And then another poster. I really went to town with the marketing. Very nice. So, I don't think this is particularly rare, this, this single, but it's nice to have. And uh, so then the album came out, and uh, for the most part it got good reviews. Um, it was more accessible than Gone Tropo and Somewhere in England probably. I don't think it's as good as George Harrison, George Harrison, but uh, it, uh, it was quite commercial uh, in terms of a lot of these songs were quite clearly three minute pop songs, um, including this single, which she, which she didn't write. So uh, good reviews, and one has to say George's guitar playing throughout is uh, superb. And uh, he really makes use of that. Jeff Lynn helps out with the production. There's a picture there of Jeff Lynn with Eric Clapton, Elton John, and George Harrison. I'm not sure why Elton John plays in this album, because they had Gary Wright as well on the piano. But uh, it's, it's almost as if George wanted as many superstars on this album, because maybe he was worried he wasn't going to have a hit or something, I don't know. Because the last album, Gone Trouble, had kind of vanished without trace. Uh, Ringo helps out on drums. It's rather a funny picture of Ringo there. Ray Cooper's on percussion. Gary Wright there, picture of him with Jim Countner on drums also. And then this guy here is Bobby Cock, who plays cello. Particularly on When We Was Fab, I think. And Jim Horn is on sax. Eric Clapton on guitar pretty much throughout. and sharing the lead duties with George. Jeff Lynne is producing it pretty well. Um, my friend Dave Costello sent me some notes on this album. He said he thinks the, al the production is a bit dated, sounds a bit claustrophobic, and uh, he prefers the, the production on, for example, George Harrison, George Harrison, and I agree. Uh, having said that, the songs are punchy. Dave recognised that it was the most commercial album from George in a long time, and uh, he really went for it, as we've said, with the videos and the interviews. So, nice cover. George smiling for a change, doesn't often, his reputation was not particularly to smile too often, so this is a nice happy picture. And uh, the back cover there, it's on the Dark Horse label. And then we go into the tracks. Well, this. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, this album is a bit of a mixed bag for me in terms of there's some songs I love and some songs I don't love quite so much. I think it's a strange opener, Cloud Nine. It's uh, some lovely guitar playing from George and Eric, kind of playing off each other. Uh, some slightly strange words and uh, a kind of minor key tune, a little bit depressing actually. I don't, one of the reasons I don't jump for this album is because the opener is a little bit bit of a downer. Uh, I mean, it's not terrible like Wake Up My Love, the opener of Gone Troppo, but uh, when I compare it to other openers from George's albums over the years, uh, Give Me Love, uh, Harry's on Tour Express from Dark Horse, Woman Don't You Cry For Me from 33 and a Third, and You from Extra Texture and Love Comes To Everyone. They're all a little bit more interesting than this particular track, in my opinion. So I know a lot of people like this track. My son Tommy loves it, and I don't dislike it. As I say, very nice guitar work. Uh, but there are better tracks on the album. The second track is one of the very best. That's what it takes. And Jeff Lynne showing his skills with arranging the backing vocals. Um, this was a kind of prelude to the Travelling Wilburys. We had two Wilburys on this album. And... Um, they were actually going to re record a B-side to the, the single This Is Love and that B-side was going to be handled with care and was at that stage when they said, well this song's far too good to be a B-side, it should be the start of something bigger, so that's what led to the Wilburys. But believe it or not, that originally was going to be a B-side and I think Handled With Care is better than anything on this album, probably. Uh, George's most classic latter-day song, no less. Um, Anyway, back to the album. So that's what it takes. Top draw, great production from Jeff Lynn, although Dave Costello thinks he'd rather hear it with uh, 
a cleaner production. Um, fish on the sand. And by the way, Jeff Lynn, I mean, obviously, he gained a reputation uh, as a superb producer, quite rightly, with starting with this album and the stuff he did for Tom Petty and Roy Orbison. But this was the start of all that. And uh, whilst his work with ELO was great production-wise, he'd kind of uh, started to go off a little bit production-wise because Secret Messages was a little bit too 80s and Balance of Power was very 80s. Far too much synthesizer and stuff. Uh, here he's getting back to more guitars and I think he must have encouraged George to play more lead guitar because that's very prevalent throughout the album. But uh, he comes up trumps. In my opinion, the production's pretty good on this album. Uh, a little bit, yeah, a little bit cluttered, but uh, it varies from track to track. Fish on the Sand is well produced and, and a snappy song. Maybe I, this could have been a better opener for the album. It's very upbeat and uh, about the closest George gets to any kind of religious imagery on the album because that is strangely lacking for the most part here. Uh, just for today is next. It's a ballad. Some people have compared it to uh, John Lennon Plastigona band kind of level, but it's not. It's not on that level. Let's face it. It's uh, nice backing vocals, nice enough tune, but it goes on at least a minute and a half too long. I think well, it's pleasant, but it's not uh, not the song you come back to too often. This is love. Is very poppy and catchy, and it's a nice video with him on the rocks by the sea, maybe in Hawaii or somewhere. Uh, a little bit of an annoying chorus on repeated listening. But, you know, a fun track. Didn't do too well as the third single from here. When We Was Fab is uh, one of the most successful production jobs on the album, and Dave Costello also said that, um, using all the Beatle tricks, you know, with the Bobby Cock playing the cello, and uh, the video is very amusing with Ringo in it, and... Uh, Elton, Neil Aspen, all a few people pop up in that video and there's a guy with a walrus mask who may or may not have been Paul, but I don't think it was, but George didn't really uh, confirm one way or the other, so developed a kind of mystique that Paul's in the video as well, but I don't think he was. Uh, very successful song, again, maybe it's been overplayed a little bit over the years, but nice production and nice humour, and as Dave said, he, it, this succeeds whereas when Ringo tries to be nostalgic about the Beatle years, maybe it doesn't come, come across quite, quite so well, probably because he's, he's done it maybe once too often. And we turn off to side two and probably get the strongest track on the album, or in the top three anyway, Devil's Radio. Uh, it really is superb. Wilbury-esque, with the backing vocals. Uh, Kind of a bit reminiscent of Tweeter and the Monkey Man of the first Wilbur's album. Great set of lyrics about people gossiping. And originally that's what the phrase Dark Horse meant to George. And that's what it was, was in Liverpool. A Dark Horse was, uh, you know, oh, he's a bit of a Dark Horse. Talking about Mr Jones because he was having an affair with the butcher's wife. Or, so Dark Horse in that sense, rather than the outsider coming from behind to win the race. Um, anyway, I digress. Devil's Radio is uh, a great song and a uh, great opener to side too. Someplace Else is a George Ballad in the nicest tradition and maybe not top draw like something or your love is forever, but it's, uh, I played it last night and it's a very nice tune. I think it might have, this song might have been actually in that film, Shanghai Surprise, which was such a flop. Um, really not the greatest film which had been in the previous year and uh, by the way I forgot to mention and Dave pointed this out George's return to the to music had really been triggered by his appearance on the Carl Perkins tribute concert from 1985 where he turned up and played guitar on a few tracks and sang uh, Everybody's Gotta Be My Baby and Ringo was also on that as well and that kind of gave him a bit of confidence and then he got friendly with Jeff Lynn and he, I think he admired ELO's work and uh, got together. And this was the result. Record the Hesperus is next. 
upbeat number. Not much of a song, but nice, interesting words and well sung by George. Uh, makes a nice change from the tracks which surrounded here. It's more upbeat. Breath Away From Heaven is a slow ballad and probably the weakest on the album. I have nothing much to say about this track. And then the single ends the album. And uh, if I'm honest, I, I tend to skip this track if I'm playing the album. The album got, tends to skip, got my mind set on you, in the same way that I may skip Ebony and Ivory when I'm playing Tug of War, just because, you know, I've heard it too often and maybe it doesn't really fit on the album for me. Uh, a lot of people love that song. A lot of people's favourite George Harrison song ever is Got My Mind Set on You, although he didn't write it. Uh, so, Horses for Courses. So, if I'm going to give this a mark out of ten, I'm going to give it a solid eight, and maybe eight and a half on a good day if I'm in the mood. But uh, it's not it's not my favourite. I prefer All Things Must Pass in the Material World and George Harrison, George Harrison for sure. And uh, I don't think it's the most honest record in terms of... Uh, I think it's deliberate. He definitely was trying to make a hit album here. And uh, he succeeded, but uh, he compromised his integrity a little bit, I think, to make this album because it's a little bit too poppy for my taste. And... Uh, Packing the album full of superstars as the backing band, I think, was a bit unnecessary. Although Eric plays great guitar, particularly on Devil's Radio, nice solo in the middle there. So uh, uh, George George's talents displayed pretty well on this album, particularly his guitar playing. Song-wise, probably not. None of these tracks were featured in the George Fest concert recently, which is interesting. Nobody chose to do a song from here. Um, it's certainly a very solid album, just not my favourite. It's a bit of a rambling video. Sorry for that. See you next time.